Hello, my name is Dr. Jenny Sanders, and in this video we're going to talk about the centrality of the citric acid cycle to aerobic metabolism. And um, when something is central, it generally means that it's in the middle, right? There's something before and something after. So you can see here is our citric acid cycle. And a number of things feed into the cycle, pretty much everything that we eat for energy. So fats, carbs, proteins, all of these, um, these food sources will, um, can eventually enter the citric acid cycle. And then after the citric acid cycle, the products of the cycle will enter the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation in order to make ATP. Remember, we eat these things up here for energy, but our cells can only use ATP for energy. So we have to convert this kind of energy from food into ATP energy for our cells. So let's take this kind of step by step. First we'll look at what feeds into the cycle and how it feeds into the cycle. So the three kind of groups of foods that we eat are proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. And each of these feed um, into the citric acid cycle uh, slightly differently. So carbohydrates, when they're broken down into sugars, they can enter glycolysis. And glycolysis is a pretty involved pathway. It's got 10 enzymes. We won't go through that here. There's more information about that in the, um, in the learning resources in the course of study. But, um, but that's, that's where the sugars will go. And the products of glycolysis are pyruvate, which is quickly changed into acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA is what will actually enter the citric acid cycle. And then we continue on the path um, to eventually get ATP. So that's how sugars will enter the cycle. They enter via pyruvate and eventually acetyl-CoA. What about fats? When we say fats in biochemistry, we're really saying triglyceride. And so when triglycerides are broken down, they're broken down into two parts, glycerol and fatty acids. The glycerol will actually enter into glycolysis and continue through the pathway of pyruvate and acetyl-CoA into the citric acid cycle. Fatty acids, on the other hand, will go through a process called beta-oxidation and will make acetyl-CoA. So they enter the citric acid cycle just via acetyl-CoA. And what about proteins? Well, when proteins are broken down into amino acids, there are 20 different amino acids that are naturally occurring in the body. And each of them is broken down um, in somewhat unique ways. And so there's actually several options for amino acids to enter the citric acid cycle. The two most common are via pyruvate or acetyl-CoA. But there are a few amino acids that can actually enter straight into different parts of the cycle itself. But for the most part, they enter through pyruvate and acetyl-CoA. So that's how things get into the cycle. Now we're going to talk about the cycle itself. So here's a diagram with the detail of the citric acid cycle. I didn't bother putting in the, uh, the structures because that can make it even more overwhelming. <laughs> I know that this, this can be a lot of information and I don't necessarily want to go through every step of the citric acid cycle because there's a great animation in the course of study that already does that. Instead, I want to go, I, I want to focus on how you can make sense of the citric acid cycle and what the different parts um, correspond to and, uh, and, and how to think about it a little bit. So, in purple here, I've shown the enzymes, and you can, can tell that something is an enzyme because its name always ends in ACE, A-C-E. And the action of enzymes is almost always represented by an arrow. So this blue arrow here is representing the action of aconitase, and that's why it's written to the side of the arrow. Whatever's at the beginning of the arrow is the substrate for that enzyme, and whatever's at the end of the arrow is a product for that enzyme. So citrate is the substrate for aconitase, and isocitrate is the product of aconitase. Now, the citrate and isocitrate and all the other names that you see in black here are also known as intermediates. And we call them intermediates because they're intermediate in the cycle, meaning that they don't necessarily stick around for long. They're, they're made and then immediately broken down. And so when you hear the term intermediate, we're talking about things like citrate or oxaloacetate that are made as part of the cycle and then um, turned into something else immediately after. And then the next kind of part of the cycle are the products, and I've shown them here in green. And you can tell that something is a product of the cycle because the arrow that's um, representing its production is going to be coming away from the cycle. Okay, so for example, here this FADH2 is made and the arrow is pointing away from the cycle. It's not in the cycle itself. Okay, um, and as 
part of the, uh, the products of the cycle, we make um, NADH, FADH2, and GTP. Okay, so all of those. Um, each turn of the cycle actually produces three NADH, um, one FADH2, and one GTP. Um, carbon dioxide is also a product of the cycle, but it's not used to make energy. It's, it's essentially a waste product. We just breathe it out, right, and get rid of it. Um, so the products that we're most concerned about when we're talking about, you know, how the citric acid cycle is central to aerobic metabolism are, um, are these, these products that are going to go on to other pathways, so the NADH, the FADH2, okay? And what these are is these are electron carriers. So in the citric acid cycle, the NADH, FADH2 will be picking up high energy electrons from the citric acid cycle to carry them to the electron transport chain, okay? So let's get to the electron transport chain. So after we've put in our metabolites, they've gone through the citric acid cycle, now we're going to follow those products to the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. <clears throat> So the two electron carriers that we that are a result of the citric acid cycle are the NADH and FADH2, and they are going to carry those high energy electrons to the electron transport chain. And I won't go into all of the electron transfers here because there's another video that already does that. But just you know, be aware that the electrons do move through this electron transport chain, and eventually they they you know they move through the chain and they they come to an end, and we need a place for them to go. And that's where oxygen comes in. Oxygen will actually pick up the, uh, these electrons, and it's what we call a terminal electron acceptor. Okay, so terminal electron. Ooh, that's an electron acceptor. Okay, and technically, in this reaction of oxygen going to water, this would be half of an oxygen. And, um, and these hydrogens, the protons that get picked up, are, are just, they're kind of always floating around in water. So there's a lot of protons around. The oxygen, when it picks up those electrons, just picks up some of the protons and it makes water. So when we are, um, you know, breaking down food and turning it into energy, it does actually produce water inside of our cells. And so that's the electron transport chain. And that's where our oxygen is used. So right here, this is the entire reason that we breathe. Um, this is aerobic metabolism, so it has to happen in the presence of oxygen, okay? And after we've done all those electron transfers, um, then we're gonna move on to this um, ATP synthase. And ATP synthase is the enzyme that's actually going to make the ATP. And it does that by um, taking ADP, and the D stands for di, so um, it's a diphosphate, and adding another phosphate. This P with the little sub I here stands for phosphate, like a free phosphate. And, um, and so ATP synthase will essentially take this phosphate and just stick it onto this ADP to make ATP, the triphosphate. Okay, and this is called phosphorylation. And the entire process is called oxidative phosphorylation. Sometimes oxidative phosphorylation is referring just to ATP synthase itself, uh, which is not incorrect, but technically the entire process is oxidative phosphorylation. And so now we've gone through all of the connections of the citric acid cycle. Um, we've talked about how things can enter the cycle, we've talked about the cycle itself, and also where the products of the cycle go in order to make ATP. If you have questions, please contact a course mentor. Thank you.